Let me see if I can do this song. Let me let me, let me move this uh this laptop. I can't even see what the hell I'm doing. Shit. Watch out, son. I get away from the fucking window. Shit. I get away from the goddamn window. This is where. It's a problem. It's, it's the sun fucking, fucking up my rotation, man. The sun, the sun is blocking my rotation. It's blocking my rotation. I can't even see myself in the sun. No, I'm not. I'm not push this bitch up, cause. I can't, uh, I'm not supposed to do this with this bullshit ass fucking son. Oh, hell with it. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do this shit anyway, man. You get this name. Let's see. George Harrison was born on 12. Arnold Grove in Waitree, Liverpool, on the 25th of February, 1943. He was the youngest of four children of Harold Hargreaves, or Hargrove Harrison, you know, and Wheeze. Harold was a bus uh, conductor, a bus, a bus conductor, uh, what's it, what? Harold was a, was a bus conductor, who had worked at a as a the ship steward, the ship steward at the on the uh, the White Star Line. Louise was Louise, Louise was a shop assistant at the uh, of the Irish Catholic descent. He had one sister, Louise, who had died uh, uh, a month ago, and two brothers, Harold Harold, who was who was still living, uh, and uh, and another brother. Who had, who, had, who had passed away uh June of, in June 1st 2007 uh had to be Peter according to Boyd Harrison's mother was particularly supportive all she wanted for her children for her children is that they should be happy they should be happy at that period and she recognized that nothing made George quite as happy as making music. Louise, Louise was an enthusiastic music fan at heart. And she was known among her friends for her loud singing voice. Yeah, her voice was like loud singing. Which at times startled the visitors by rattling Harrison's, Harrison's windows. Yeah, the windows of the Harrison house. Uh, the Harrison residence. Uh, when Louise was pregnant with, with George, she often listened to the weekly weekly broadcast Radio India, a biographer of uh, for the Harrison family, uh, Joshua Green, wrote that, that every Sunday she tuned in to the mystical sounds evoked, evoked by sitars and tablas. Hoping that hoping that the exotic music would bring the peace and the calm to the baby in the womb. Harrison, Harrison lived the first four years of his life at 12 Arnold Grove, a terraced house on a cul-de-sac. The home, it had an outdoor toilet, and its only heat came into a single coal fire in 1949. The family was offered a council house and moved up to 25 Upton Green. Speak. Uh, was it Speaky? Specky, I think. 
Nails, that's, that's, um, that's, that's like, what's about, how do you pronounce this thing? Oh, it was in uh, 1948, at the age of five, Harrison enrolled at the Dubdale Primary School. He passed the 11 plus exam and attended. Uh, it was it was, it was a, an institution high school. It's all boys institution high school that was in in England. It's called the Liverpool Institute. High school, yeah, it's called the Liverpool Institute High School for Boys. That was ran from 1954 to 1959. From 1954 to 1959, though the Institute did offer a music course, Harrison was disappointed with the absence of the guitars and felt that the school had molded, uh, you know, the younger, the younger students into being frightened. Harrison's earlier musical influences included George Formby, Cap Calway, these are OGs, the Django Reinhardt, and Hoagie Carmichael. Yeah, the name's Hoagie Carmichael by the 1950s. Carl Perkins and Lonnie Donegan, was it? What is his name? Lonnie Donegan. That's the name, Lonnie Donegan? Oh, yeah. There were those significant influences. In early 1956, Harrison had an epiphany, an epiphany that he had while he was riding his bicycle. He heard Elvis Presley's Heartbreak Hotel a song playing from a nearby house, and the song piqued his interest in rock and roll, in rock and roll. He often sat at the back of the class drawing, drawing the guitars. George likes to draw guitars. He likes to start, he likes to start drawing those guitars. He was in the back of the class, likes to start drawing. He likes to start drawing those guitars, the guitars that he started drawing, drawing in his school books. And he, he later commented and said, he said that he was totally into guitars. What the Harrison cited to cited has Slim Whitman as another early influence in his life. In his life, the person he ever saw playing a guitar had to be Slim Whitman. He either he either a photo of him in a magazine or live or live on TV, where the guitars were definitely coming in. And the first Harold Harrison, I think. Harold Harrison. You know, he was apprehensive about his son's interest in pursuing a music career. However, in 1956, on that year, he bought George a Dutch Egmond flat top acoustic guitar, which, which according to Harold, that cost him like what? $3.10. Three three dollars three 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 pounds and ten ten little, what was it? What was it pounds or quid? That was equivalent from what ninety quid or whatever. That was like equivalent. It says three tens in. I think it was in. I think it was in um. I think it's in like English quid or something. That's what it was this year. One of his father's. Friends taught Harrison, the younger George Harrison, how to play that whispering sweet Sue and and what's the word? Dinah? Dinah, that's that's inspired by Donegan's music. Yeah, Donegan's music. Harrison formed a skiffle group. A skiffle, a skiffle group that was called the Rebels. It's where his brother Peter, you know, um, was no longer with him. And a friend that goes by the name of Arthur of uh, Arthur Kelly. On the bus to school, Harrison met uh, Sir James Paul McCartney. Okay, who was an English singer and songwriter and musician, who also attended the Liverpool Institute, and the pair bonded over their over their shared love of music. Let's go to the to uh, the 50s and the 70s. That's where the Beatles started. 
McCartney and his friend, the late John Lennon, were in a skiffle group that was called the Quarrymen. In March of 1958, and McCartney's urging Harrison auditioned for the group at Rory Storm, the Rory Storm's Morg Skiffle Club. That's what we call it, the, the Morg Skiffle Club that was owned by a man named Rory Storm. It was ran by a, a, a man named Rory Storm uh, who, who, had, who has already became uh, this leader. But he was a musician and a vocal, he was a musician in England and he was a vocalist who was from Liverpool. So was England. Yep, yeah. Harrison auditioned, or yeah, that's what Harrison did. George Harrison had auditioned for the quarrymen at the, the Morgue Skiffle Club that was ran by Rory Storm. By playing Arthur, you know, the Guitar Boogie Smith's, yeah, Arthur Guitar Boogie Smith's Guitar Boogie Shuffle. That's Arthur uh, Guitar Boogie Smith. That's Arthur Swift. They call him Guitar Boogie. He was an American musician, songwriter, and producer. The song he did was Guitar Boogie Shuffle, which which that he did. He's the one that played the guitar. Uh, but but Lennon felt that Harrison, the younger Harrison, having just turned fifteen, he was in his teens. He was too young to join the band. Well, the underage rate. James McCartney arranged a second meeting on the upper on the upper deck of a Liverpool England bus, on the bus of a bus on the deck upper deck of a bus in Liverpool, England. Okay, during which Harrison impressed Lennon by performing the performing the lead guitar part for the instrumental raunchy. He began socializing with the group. Well, I already, I already cut my nails earlier, so I had to cut them. But I broke, I broke, my, I broke my nail um, trying to climb into a fucking trash box. He began socializing with the group, filling in on guitar as needed. He and then became accepted as a member although his father wanted him to continue his education back at uh if it was back at back in uh at a high school uh near yeah, the Liverpool Liverpool Institute high school for boys Harrison left a uh, school which was the Liverpool Institute high school for boys in Liverpool Liverpool England he left. He left there. At the, he he was leaving there at the age of sixteen, and he started working for several for several months. Well, what else did Harrison did? He was leaving school at the age of sixteen, and he, he started working for several months. As uh, he was in a he working as a apprentice electrician at a at this electro uh, this electrical company that goes by the name of Blackers, named Blackers. It was a large. It was an electric. It wasn't even an electric, electrical store. It was a, a huge department store that was located in uh in Liverpool, Liverpool, England, in Liverpool, in Liverpool, England. That's three miles of a uh, Blackpool. That's where William Regal uh, was from. What is William Regal was uh, was living in uh, Liverpool? I think Norman Norman Smiley Norman Smiley is from there. I, don't know if I remember Norman Smiley who used to work for for WCW who was. He's now working for the WWE as one of the coaches. He is he 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 lives in Liverpool, uh, England. Blackers, B L A C K L E R S, Blackers. It was a local department store. When George Harrison uh, was started working for several months, several months as an apprentice electrician, but. During the group's first tour in Scotland in 1960, Harrison had used the pseudonym. The pseudonym, the pseudonym he used was a uh, the Carl Harrison name. 
for the pseudonym. The pseudonym, the name of, of a pseudonym he used was a uh, Cole Harrison name. That was a reference to a man named Cole Perkins. That was a Cole Perkins thing. Uh, so Cole Perkins reference. So that's reference to Cole Perkins that we use the pseudonym. The pseudonym Harrison had used, that, that name was used. The pseudonym, why use that? All that is a reference to Carl Perkins. But go, let's go to 1960. Let's go to 1960 for a minute. That feels around, that was around, that's around the time my, well, my father was born at the period. Remember, I think my father was born on that year, 1960. That was back in the day. Ellen Williams, Ellen Williams, who was a promoter, has, a raging, has been arranging a raging for the band for the band who was now calling themselves the Beatles. The Beatles is it's a it's a group, it's a band, it's a, a band that you've seen back in those days. It says in 1960, Alan Williams arranging he's arranged for the band now call themselves, now calling themselves the uh, the Beatles, the Beatles, to play at the Indra and in Kaiser Keller and Kaiser Keller clubs. In uh, Hamburg, both owned by a man named a man named Bruno Koschmeider. Bruno Koschmeider. Their first residency in Hamburg ended prematurely. Prematurely, when Harrison was deported for being too young to work to work in nightclubs. Nightclub said he's too young to work for inside of. When Brian Epstein became uh, the, uh, the band's manager in December of 1961, he polished up their, their image and later secured them a recording contract with, with EMI uh, Recordings, EMI Group Limited. Uh, their first single, the group, their first single is called Love Me Do. It peaked at number 17 at the record retailer chart. And by the time their debut album, Please Please Me, was released in early 1963, it got released. Beatlemania had started to arrive. Often serious, often serious and started focusing and focusing while they were on stage, while on stage with the band. Harrison was so known as the, the you know, the quiet Beatle. That moniker had arose when the Beatles arrived in the U.S. in early 1964, and Harrison was ill with a case of, was it, strep throat. Yeah, strep throat. And a fever and was medically advised to limit speaking as much as possible until he performed on, he performed on the Ed Sullivan Show, which was a, which was a classic show, which was a classic uh, show. It was a an old it was a variety show. It was a, a variety show that's been around from from the from uh, it's been out since the 1940s. CBS used to put that show in the air in the 1940s until in the first until its last in uh in 1971 until it got canceled. Until it got canceled, its schedule it schedule as such, the press had noticed Harrison and his apparent laconic nature. In the public appearances on that tour, and the subsequent nickname is called. I mean, the subsequent nickname is stuck around. It stuck around for a while. It started to stick. As much to Harrison's amusement, he had two lead two lead vocal credits on the LP. Is including the. Uh, it's like a put together song that uh, the Lennon McCartney song. That's what it's the Lennon McCartney song, so that's what's been around. I, I think mean, that kind of uh, rose in from 1940 until it until it completely until it split away in 1980, and when uh, when John Lennon died, when John Lennon when John Lennon was killed, it happened when John Lennon was killed by some stalker fan, you know. Or the song that uh that the Lennon McCartney had done, that Lennon McCartney had Lennon, Lennon McCartney had done a song, they did it together. It's uh 
It's called, do you want to know? It says, do you want to know a secret? That's what it says. Do you want to know a secret? It was a song that they, uh, John and Paul and John and James had did together. Uh, and the three in the and on three on their on their album, which was album number two, is called "With the Beatles." With the Beatles, you know, it, it's called "With the Beatles." It was from that's a that's three of them on the on a, on the album. It's their second album that they did together. Uh, the last one included it says "Don't Bother Me." It's a word. That's what the last one is including. There's another song that I think I don't know who that last of the song is. Oh, it says it says don't bother me. It's a word. That's a word is don't bother me. That's a word. It's Harrison's first solo writing the credit. Harrison is serving as the scout for the Beatles. For that for those new American, those new American releases have been especially uh knowledgeable about soul music. About soul music. Well, in 1965. By 1965's Rubber Soul, he had begun to lead the other Beatles into folk rock, into folk rock, though his interest in the birds and Bob Dylan. The birds did a song, I didn't know about how the birds are. The birds did a song, I think that was for, they did that song for the Forrest Gump uh, movie. The birds and Bob Dylan. This is his interest. And towards Indian classical music, Indian classical music, which as much as I did not know of, it was through his use of the uh, the, uh, the sitar of, yeah, the sitar of the Norwegian wood. This bird has flown. He later called Rubber Soul, his favorite Beatles album, Rubber, including three of his compositions, Tax man is selected as the uh, it was selected as the uh, the album's opening track is called Love You Too and and I Want to Tell You. His drone is drone like Tambua, part on Lennon's Tomorrow Never Knows, exemplifies exemplifies the uh, the band the band's ongoing exploration of the non Western instruments while the sitar and tabla based Love You Too represented the Beatles' first genuine foray, the first genuine foray into Indian music. According to the the ethnomusicologist by the name by the name of David Reck, the latter song have latter song has set a precedent in a popular music as an example of the Asian culture being represented by the Westerners. Respectfully and with, without a parody, author Nicholas Schaffner, yeah, Nicholas Schaffner, wrote in 1978 that following Harrison's increased association, association with the sitar after Norwegian Wood, he became known as the Maharaja, the Maharaja of Raga or Ragawak. Was it the Maharaja? Why you name it the Maharaja of Ragawak? That's what's known as. Harrison has continued to develop his interest in a non-Western instrumentation, playing Swarmandal, Swarmandal, on the uh, what is it, Strawberry Fields Forever? By late nineteen, by late nineteen sixty-six, Harrison's interest had moved away from the Beatles. This was reflected in his choice. Of Eastern gurus and the religious leaders, for the inclusion on the album cover, it's called Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. In the late in the late 1960s, his sole composition on the album was the uh, Indian-inspired "With Within You, Without You," to which no other Beatle contributed. He played sitar and tambura on the track backed by the musicians from from the London Asian Music Circle in Daruba, in Daruba, Swarmandal, and Tabla. He later commented on the Sgt. Pepper album. 
it was a milestone and a milestone in the music country there's about half the songs that he would like and the other half that he cannot he cannot stand until january 1968 he recorded this this basic track for his song the inner light at the at the emi studio in bombay it was in bombay india it was in bombay india um using a group of the of the local musicians playing traditional traditional indian instruments yeah that's what the instruments are they play these instruments that came from india uh released as the uh, the b-side to mccartney's lady madonna it was the first harrison composition to appear on a on a single that was for the beatles group this is the beatles in 1967 uh the main two people that's, that's gone was uh that the main two people that died was uh was uh john lennon and uh george harrison r.i.p r.i.p those two the main two people that's left was uh was Paul uh, was Sir James Paul McCartney and um Ringo Starr. Ringo Starr. Those two people are still alive. It was the first Harrison composition to appear on a Beatles on a Beatles single derived from a quotation, a quotation from the Tao Te Ching. The song's lyric reflected Harrison's deepening interest in hinduism and meditation meditation during the recording of the beatles that same year tensions within the group within the group ran high and drummer ringo star quit ringo star that's ringo star was still alive richard starkey yep he quit he started to quit the uh the band briefly uh harrison's four songwriting contributions Contributions to the double album, the double album that was including While My Guitar Gently Weeps, which featured Eric Clapton on the lead guitar on the and the horn driven uh, was it Subway Truffle. Dylan and the band were a major major musical influence on Harrison at the end of at the end of his career with, with the group, the Beatles. While on a visit to Woodstock, well, it's in late 1968. That was in November of that year. He established a friendship with with Dylan. Yeah, he established a relationship with uh with Dylan. Was this one Dylan? What's the Dylan? Probably Bob. It's probably Bob Dylan. Yep. Yep. Yeah, Dylan, that's what I think is what happened. He established a relationship, a friendship with, with, uh, with Dylan and found himself drawn to the band's sense of communal music making and to the creative equality. JD hated that word so, so much he gets sick and tired of hearing it. I say fuck equality. Fuck equality. That's how that's how I felt. Among yeah, creative equality. Yes, that's the word. Creative equality among the band members, which contrasted with Lennon and McCartney's yeah, Lennon and McCartney's domination of the Beatles' songwriting and creative direction. This coincided with with a pro, uh, was it a prolific period. A prolific period in his songwriting and a and a and a growing desire to assert his independence from the Beatles. The tensions have among the group has surfaced again in January of 1969. This is a couple. This is a couple months after you know November of 68. That happened at Twickenham. Had that Twickenham was it? Twickenham Studios. That's the name Twickenham Studios. I think they named that, 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 that studio. During the filmed rehearsals that became the 1970 documentary, it's called Let It Be. 
frustrated by the cold and sterile film studio by Lennon's creative disengagement from the Beatles and by what he perceived he perceived as a domineering attitude from McCartney, Harrison, Harrison quit, quit the group. Why the hell? He, he's just like Ringo Starr. He wanted, he wanted to quit the group. He just quit the group? Why are you quitting the group? Harrison is quitting the group. I don't know why Harrison, Harrison wants to bail out, out the group. I do not know why he bailed. Uh, on, the, on, on, the, on the 10th of January, you know what I mean? He returned 12 days later after his, his bandmates agreed, agreed to move the film project to their own Apple studio to, and to abandon McCartney's plan for making a return to the public performance. Relations, uh, relations among the Beatles were more cordial than I suspected. Though it's still strained. It's still strained, though. When, when the band is recording their, their album, Night, uh, Abbey Road, in 1969, the LP included what the, uh, the, Labazzoli, the Labazzoli describes as the two classic contributions from Harrison. Here comes the sun and something that saw him finally achieve equal songwriting status with, within Lennon and McCartney, along with, with, with Lennon and McCartney. During the album's recording, during the album's recording, Harrison asserted more creative control than it was before, rejecting, rejecting those suggestions, the suggestions that was for the changes to his music, particularly, particularly from McCartney. From McCartney himself, uh, something became his first A side, A side which, when it's issued on a double A side single, it's called "Come Together." The song was number one in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and West Germany, and the combined uh, sides topped the uh, Billboard 100 chart in the U.S. Hold on, I got, I can't think about the fan. Hold on, man. And combined sides topped the Billboard 100 Hot 100 chart in the U.S. And in the 70s, Frank Sinatra recorded something twice, 1970 and 1979, and later dubbed it the greatest love song uh, of the past 50 years. The past 50 years, uh, Lennon, Lennon considered Lennon considering it. Lennon is always doing doing what he wants what he wants to do back in the day. But he's considering it. He's considering this thing like the song. It was like he considered it. Uh, what's the song? Is Abbey Road? I think he considered the best song, considering it the best song, and uh, on Abbey Road and and it became the Beatles' uh, second most covered song. That was after the song like what yesterday. We're going to 1974, May, May of that year, 1970. Harrison's song "For You Blue" was coupled on a U.S. single with the song that Paul McCartney had had uh had did, "The Long and Winding Road," "The Long and Winding Road," and became Harrison's Harrison's second chart topper. When the sites were listed together together at the uh, number one on the uh, Hot 100. He, his increased productivity, yeah, his increased productivity meant that by the time of their breakup, he had amassed a stockpile, a stockpile of unreleased compositions. Compositions. When while Harrison, he grew, he grew as a songwriter. He likes to write songs. His compositional presence was on the Beatles albums remained limited two or three songs, two or three songs, including his frustration, increasing his frustration and significantly contributing to the band's breakup. Harrison, his last recording session that was with, that was with the Beatles that was on January 4th, 1970. January 4th, 1970, when he, McCartney and Starr recorded his song, I, Me, Mine, for the, uh, the soundtrack album to let it be 
1968 to 1987 solo career. The early solo work before the breakup of the Beatles, Harrison had already recorded and released about two solo albums, Wonder Wall Music and Electronic Sound, both of which contained mainly instrumental compositions. Compositions like Wonder Wall Music, a soundtrack to the uh, the Wonder Wall film in 1968, the film called Wonder Wall that was in 1968. Well, it was in the 60s. It blends in with the uh, with the Indian and Western instrumentation, while the electronic sound. Oh, this is why I do not like the sun. I hate the sun. I can't even see myself talk. It blends. Indian and Western instrumentation. Let me turn this off then because I can't even see what the hell I'm doing. This is this on the suck. See, this is why I have my problems with this goddamn sun. I should have let the sun die a little bit. But no, they didn't want they didn't wanna they let the sun keep continuing. Ah I can't do it. Can't do it. I gotta I gotta move the other side. I gotta go on the other side. I can't I can't I can't do a live show with the sun fucking fucking up my uh my color scheme. I'm sorry man. I can't do it man. It's fucking up my color scheme. It's fucking up my color scheme man. I can't do it. It's fucking my color scheme up. Just can't do it. It's ruining my color scheme. I'm, I'm not. I'm not gonna be able to work uh, uh, on this on this uh, live show like this, man. I can't. I can't do it like that. I'm sorry. I can't. I cannot do it like that. Okay. Blends Indian and Western instrumentation. While electronic sound is is an experimental album that prom prominently features a Moog synthesizer, released in the late 1968, Wonder Wall Music was the first solo album by a Beatle, and the first LP released released by Apple Records. Indian musicians Ashish Khan and Shib Kumar Sharma. That's the word Shib Kumar Sharma. They performed. They performed on the album. The album that they're performing, uh, which contains the ex experimental sound collage, uh, dream scene recorded several months before Lennon's Revolution Nine in December 1969. In December 19 in, the, in December of 1969, Harrison participated in a brief tour in a brief tour of Europe. Europe with the American group Delaney and Bonnie and friends Delaney and Bonnie and friends that's what they that's who they are during the tour include that included Clapton Bobby Woodlock yeah Bobby Woodlock you know Eric Clapton Jim Gordon who was a drummer and the band's leaders Delaney and Bonnie Bramlett Delaney and uh the name Bonnie Bramlett Bonnie Bramlett uh Harrison Harrison began to play slide guitar and also began to write My Sweet Lord. My Sweet Lord is the song that they wrote, that he wrote, uh, which he became his first single as an artist by himself, solo. All things must pass. For many years, Harrison was restricted in his songwriting contributions to the Beatles albums but he released All Things Must Pass, a triple album with two discs of his songs and a third of recordings of Harrison jamming with, with friends. Oh, with friends. The album was regarded by many of uh, at his as his best work, his best work, and it topped the, uh, the charts. It's top of the charts on the both sides here of the Atlantic, the Atlantic. Uh, the LP produced the number one hit single is called My Sweet Lord. 
and the top 10 single what is life the album was was approached by it was co-produced oh it's co-produced by this man who had died the late phil specter let me push the name in the late philip uh late harvey philip specter that's him the late harvey philip specter that's the guy who co-produced the uh, the single what is life R.I.P. Uh, Harvey Philip Spector. God, I miss him. I miss this man. He was a, he was a co-producer for those songs. Yep, the album the album was co-produced by Harvey Spector, using his wall his wall of sound his wall of sound approach. Yeah, that approach he uses the wall of the wall of sound approach and the musicians musicians including Ringo Starr Erica Clapton uh <coughs> oh, <God. coughs> oh fuck and the musicians including Ringo Ringo Starr Erica Clapton Gary Wright Billy Preston Klaus Klaus Warman Klaus Warman the whole of Delaney and Boone, I forgot Delaney. The whole of the whole of Delaney and Bonnie's friends band, as we call it, the whole the whole of Delaney and Bonnie's friends band, and the Apple Group it goes by the name of Badfinger. Yeah, the name Badfinger. On release, all things must pass was was received uh, with a critical acclaim. Ben Ben Gerson. Ben Gerson of the Rolling Stone magazine had described it as being of a classic Spectorian proportions. Wagnerian, Brock, Brocknerian, what's it? Wagner, Wagnerian, Brocknerian. What's the word? Wag, what's Wagnerian and Brocknerian? Brocknerian. Those names, Wagnerian and Brocknerian. What's with the proportional words here? The music of the mountaintops in vast horizons. Author and musicologist Ian Inglis. Ian Inglis. Yeah, I N G L I S. Considers the lyrics of the uh, album's title track a recognition of the impermanent. And uh, was it? Oh, the impermanence of human existence. A simple and poignant conclusion. To Harrison's former band, yeah, Harrison's old band, folks. In 1971, Bright Bright Tunes, oh, they sued Harrison for copyright infringement over this song, "My Sweet Lord." Owing owing to its similarity to the Chiffon's 1963 hit, "He's So Fine," "He's So Fine," it was a 1963 hit that was from the Chiffon's. They got beef. They got legal beef. When the case was heard in the U.S. District Court in 1976, the U.S. District Court, yeah, that happened back in the 70s. When he denied, he denied deliberately plagiarizing the song, but lost his case. Lost his case, like, but it's lost, was it? Oh, yeah, but lost the case as the judge ruled that he had done so subconsciously in 2000 apple records released the 13th anniversary edition of the of the album and harrison active actively participated in his promotion in the interview he reflected on the work it's just something that was like his continuation continuation from the beatles really he said that he was it was like him sort of getting out of the beatles and his he's going his he's just going his own way it was a happy it's a very happy occasion which that he which that he said it was a happy occasion it was a very happy occasion <clears throat> on the production he commented on well he said like well in those days it was like it was like the reverb was reverb was kind of used uh a bit more what would he what he would do uh now in fact 
he doesn't use a verb at all. He cannot stand it. Sorry, JD. I'm still still uh doing it. I'm still doing the story. You know, it's hard to go back to anything dirty years, and he expected to how to how how you would want it now. The Bangladesh concert. It's a Bangladesh con it's a Bangladesh concert in 1971. Harrison responded to a request from Ravi Shankar by organizing a charity event, the concert for Bangladesh, which took place in 1971 in August 1st of that year. That year, the event drew over 40,000 people to two shows in New York's in New York's Madison Square Garden. Madison Square Garden is in New York. Well, the CMSG. Uh, the goal of the event was to uh, to raise the money, the money to aid those starving refugees during the uh, the Bangladesh Liberation War. Shankar Shankar opened opened the show, which that he featured popular musicians such as uh, Bob Dylan, Eric Clapton, Leon Russell, Bad Finger. It was Preston Star. It was Preston Star. I hope. It was Preston and Star Hope. Preston and Star. They said Dylan Clapton, Leon Russell, Badfinger, Preston and Star. Ringo Ringo Star came in. Uh to show their support. See the triple album, the concert for Bangladesh, was released by was released by Apple in December. Followed by followed by a concert film in 1972, credited to George Harrison and Friends. The album the album topped in the UK chart and it peaked at number two in the US, and it went on to win the Grammy Award for the album of the year. The album of the year. And there's some tax troubles and there's some questionable expenses. Go on. Yeah. Tax troubles. They yeah, had the tax troubles and some questionable questionable expenses like to have tied up many of the proceeds. But Harrison had commented, he said the mainly mainly the concert was to attract attention to the situation. The money that they raised, him and the group had raised was uh was so secondary. And although he they had some money problems, but they but other people still got plenty. Even though it was a drop in the ocean, the main thing was they, they already spread the word and they helped get the war to end. See, this is this is the uh, the thing goes on about living in the material world. See, Harrison's 1973 album had held the number one spot on the Billboard albums chart for at least five weeks. Five weeks, it, chart, it, it was on the album chart, or the Billboard album uh, chart. And the album's single, Give Me Love, Give me peace on earth also reaching the, the number one spot in the u.s in the uk the lp peaked at number two and, and, and the single was reaching number eight the album was lavishly produced produced and packaged the way it should be and its dominant message was harrison's hindu beliefs in green's in green's opinion in green's opinion it, it contained many of the strongest strongest compositions of his career. Stephen Holden, writing in Rolling Stone magazine, felt that the album was vastly appealing and profoundly seductive. And that it stood alone as the article of fate, miraculous, miraculous in was miraculous in its radiance. Other reviewers were less enthusiastic, were less enthusiastic describing the uh, the release as the release is awkward sanctimonious and overly sentimental until late 1974 harrison became the first ex beetle to tour the north america when he was be, he's going to begin his 45 date dark horse tour dark horse tour as which was named the shows included guest spots by billy preston who was like a band member tom scott who was a band member and traditional and contemporary indian music that was performed by Ra Ravi Shankar, family and friends. Despite numerous positive reviews, the consensus reaction to the tour was negative. Some fans found Shankar's significant 
presence to be a bizarre disappointment, and many were affronted by what what Ingus what Ingus is describing as Harrison's sermonizing. Further, he rework he reworking those lyrics to several Beatles songs, and his laryngitis affected vocals led to some critics calling the the tour dark horse. The dark horse. Like it a and dark horse. They messed it all up. They made it. They think he's had his, his learning just fucked him up. The, Robert Rodriguez, who was an author, had commented while the Dark Horse tour might be considered a noble, a noble failure. A noble failure. There was a number of fans who were tuned in to what was being attempted. They went away ecstatic, conscious that they had just witnessed something so uplifting that it could never be repeated. Simon Lang, he called the, the tour groundbreaking and revolutionary. That's what two words, groundbreaking and revolutionary, revolutionary in its presentation of Indian music. In December, Harrison released Dark Horse, which was an album that earned him the least favorable reviews of his career. Rolling Stone called it the chronicle of a performer out of his element, working to a deadline, unfeebling his overtaxed talents by a rush to deliver a, a new LP product rehearsal band and assemble a cross country tour all within three weeks. The album reached number four on the Billboard chart and the single Dark Horse reached number 15, but they failed to make an impact in the UK. The music critic, Michael, Michael Gilmore, Michael Gilmore had, had uh, described Dark Horse as one of Harrison's most fascinating works, a record about changing laws. Harrison's final studio album that was for EMI and Apple Records and the, and the soul music inspired Extra Texture, read all about it, picked at number eight on the Billboard chart. And number 16 in the UK, Harrison considered it the least satisfactory of the three albums he had recorded since All Things Must Pass. Lang identified bitterness and dismay. In, the, in many of the tracks, many of the tracks, his longtime friend Klaus Vorman, Klaus Vorman, that's his name, K L A U S V O O R M A N N, he commented he wasn't up, he wasn't up for it, he wasn't even up for that, uh, for one of the tracks yet. It was a terrible time because. Uh, he started thinking that there was a lot of coke uh, going around. There was a lot of coke going around. That means cocaine uh, going around, and that's and that's when he got out of the picture. He bailed because of goddamn cocaine. Vorman, Vorman had already bailed the fuck out of it because he saw he saw the drugs. He saw the he saw the uh, the cocaine. He saw the powder of cocaine. He think that he figured that was a lot of cocaine going around, and that's where he got out of the picture. That's why he bailed. He does. He did not like the frame. He didn't like the frame of mind that that Harrison had. Harrison Harrison is releasing two singles from the LP. It's called "You," which reached the Billboard number, uh, the Billboard Top Twenty, and this called this song called "The Guitar." Can't keep from crying. Apple's final original single release in 1976, uh, that's a, uh, one of the songs, that's one of the albums that's there, 33 and one third. Harrison's first album released on his own Dark Horse Records label, which he founded. Which, which, uh, it was, it was, it was, it was we call it the Dark Horse Records label. I think he started that record label. I think he found that that record label. I mean, he's a boss. He's like, he's like a boss of it. Uh, he produced. He started producing the singles, the hit singles, like called this song and Cracker Box Palace, is which of whom he he did produce. Both of which reached the top number twenty five in the U.S. 
not I forgot top 25 that was in US uh the surreal humor hold on let me get let me see what I can do now I can see now I can see the surreal humor of Cracker Box Palace reflected Harrison's association with mighty with Monty Python's Eric Idle who have directed a comical music video for the song with an emphasis on melody in music and musicianship musicianship and a more subtle subject matter than the pious message of his earlier works 33 and one third uh earned Harrison his most favorable critical notices notices in the u.s since all things must pass the album the album peaked just outside of top 10 there but he outsold his previous two lps he outsold those two previous lps of his as part of his promotion for the release harrison performed harrison performed on the the saturday night lives uh uh show the snl show uh, with uh, with Paul Simon. In 1979, Harrison released uh, uh what does it say? What did he released? He released uh he released his eighth studio album that was already named after him, which followed his second marriage and the birth of his son Donnie, his son Donnie. Co-produced, co-produced by Russ Titelman. Russ Titelman. The album and the single Blow Away both made the top Billboard Top 20. The the album marking the uh, the album is the album is marking the beginning of Harrison's gra- uh, gradual retreat from the music business, with the several of the songs that haven't been written in the tranquil setting of Maui. And the Hawaiian, in the Hawaiian archipelago, yeah, the archipelago. That's what we call the the Hawaiian archipelago. Lange described George Harrison as melodic and lush, peaceful. The work of a the work of a man who had lived rock and the rock and roll dream twice over, and the now embracing and was now embracing domestic as well. As spiritual bliss. It was 1980 and 87. The murder of John Lennon on December 8, 1980, disturbed Harrison and reinforced his reinforced his decades long concern about the stalkers. The tragedy was the tragedy was also a deep personal loss. Although Harrison and Lennon had little con had little contact. In the years before before Lennon was killed, before Lennon was killed, following following the murder, Harrison commented, "After all we went through together, I had I had and still have, I had and still have, great love and respect for John Lennon. For John Lennon, I am shocked and stunned. Harrison modified the lyrics of a song that he had written for Star to make the song a tribute." to Lennon, to Lennon. All those all those years ago, which included vocal contri- contributions from Paul McCartney, from, from Paul McCartney and his wife, his wife Linda. As well as Star's original original drum part had peaked number two in the US uh, charts. The single was included on the album is called Somewhere in England in 1981. Harrison did not release any of the new albums for five years after 1982's Gone Trapo, Gone Trapo, which was it was it's receiving it's receiving something, it received a little notice from the critics or the public. During his this this yeah during this period, oh he made several guest appearances, including a 1985 performance performance tribute to Carl Perkins, titled Blue Sway Shoes, a rockabilly season. In March of 86, 
he made a surprise appearance during the finale during the finale of the Birmingham Heartbeat Charity Concert. An event organized to raise money for the Birmingham for the Birmingham Children's Hospital. That's what it is, the Birmingham Children's Hospital. The following year, the following year he appeared at the Prince's Trust concert in London's Wembley Arena. They had the Wembley Arena in London, England. In London, England. Wembley. They had the Wembley Arena. It's in London. It's in London. Performing performing while my guitar gently weeps and here comes the sun in early 1987 he joined dylan john fogarty and jesse ed davis on stage for a two-hour performance performance with the blues musician taj mahal harrison recalled he said bob rang ranging him up he said bob rang them up yeah he says let me go with with Bob. Bob rang me up and asked if I wanted to come out uh, for the evening and see Taj Mahal. So we went there and had a few of these Mexican beers and had a few more. A few more. Bob says, "Why, hey, why don't we all get up and play? And you can sing." But every time I got near the microphone, why? Yeah, but every time I got near the microphone, the mic, yeah, but every time I got near the mic, Dylan comes up and starts and just starts singing this rubbish in my ear, trying to throw me. Which that, which that happened, which he said, uh, in November of 87, late 1987, Harrison released the platinum album is called Cloud Nine. Jeff Lynn had co-produced it, you know. Jeff Lynn, Jeffrey Lynn, anybody remember Jeffrey Lynn? Remember Jeffrey Lynn? Remember, remember him? He was an English musician, singer, and songwriter. Okay, that's Jeffrey Lynn. He was from the Electric, Electric Light Orchestra. The ELO, the Electric Light Orchestra. Uh, the album included Harrison's rendition to James Ray's Got My Mindset on You, which went to number one in the US and number two in the UK. The accompanying music video had received substantial airplay and another single, When We Was Fab, a retrospective of the Beatles' career. It earned two MTV uh, MVA like music video awards, like two MTV music video awards. Oh yeah, music video awards. Yeah, M MVA. So it he that earned two nominations for the MTV music video awards nominations. That was in 1988. It was recorded at his estate in Friar Park. You know Harrison's. Harrison's slide guitar is playing featured prominently on the album, on the album, you know, which included several of his longtime musical collaborators, including Clapton, Jim Keltner, and Jim Horn. Cloud Nine, Cloud Nine is reaching number eight and ten on the US and UK charts, respectively. And several tracks, several tracks from the uh, from the album achieved. Placement on the Billboard's mainstream rock chart, Devil's Radio, This Is Love, and Cloud Nine. This is from 1988, 1986, 1988, and 1996, the later careers. Later that year, 1988, Harrison formed the Traveling Woolburys with, with Jeffrey Lynn, Roy Orbison, Bob Dylan, and Tom Petty. The band had, the band had gathered in Dylan's garage. They gathered in Dylan's garage to record us to record a song for a Harrison European single release. A European single release that came from, from, from Harrison. Harrison's record company decided what the track is. They, they had their decision on the track, uh, handle with care, and this used from boxes. I used to see shit on boxes. It says handle with care. 
when I was a kid, I used to I used to see shit. I used to see shit. I used to see shit, used to see shit like that. Like boxes like it has says handle with care. HWC means handle with care. That's the song, that's the track right there. George Harrison's record company has has made a decision to get the to get the track going. It's called Handle With Care. It was too good for its original its original purpose as a B-side. And it's asking, and it's or they start asking for what a full album. The LP Traveling Traveling Wilburys Volume One LP. It was released in in, uh, in October of uh, 1988. It was in October of 1988, and it was recorded under the pseudonyms, the pseudonyms as the Hat Brothers, supposed sons of Charles Truscott. Truscott is what it is. The supposed sons of all these guys like Hat Brothers and supposed sons of. Charles Truscott, Charles Truscott Wolbury, what was the name? Charles Truscott Wolbury Sr. That's a name I never even heard of in years. Never heard that name. In, I never heard that. I never even heard of that name in years. Charles Truscott Wolbury Sr. Which I never even heard of Charles Truscott Wolbury Jr. I did not know of. It reached number sixteen. It's reaching like like it was here. Yep, that LP is reaching number sixteen in the UK and number three in the US, where it's been where it was certified was was certified. Wait, what's it? That's what it says. It reached number sixteen in the UK and three in the US, where it was certified triple platinum. Harrison pseudonym on the album was Nelson Wolbury. Why well, coined it anyway and he used that other name. The other name is Spike Wolbury. He used that name for for their second album. Ouch. He used that name for a, for a second for a second album? Spike Wolbury? Why use that? Why use that? Is Nelson Wolbury? Why use that name is Nelson Wolbury and you go use the name Spike Wolbury? No, made no sense for a second album. God, these people, God is, God is, these people are that stupid. God, these people are that fucking retarded. In 1989, Harrison and Starr they appeared in a music video for Petty's song "I Won't Back Down." In October of that year, Harrison assembled and released. The best of Dark Horse from the seventies, from the seventies to the eighties, a compilation of his later solo work. The album included three new songs, including "Cheer Down," which Harrison had recently contributed to the Lethal Weapon Two film soundtrack. There's Lethal Weapon Two uh, film soundtrack. It was out in the eighties. It was throwing. Um, it was. It was uh, directed by Richard Donner. It was throwing the likes of Mel Gibson and Danny Glover, Joe Pesci, Josh Acklin, Derek O'Connor, and Patsy Kensett. Well, the very first Lethal Weapon was out in like 1988. So. Following the death of Roy Orbison in December of 1988, the Wilburys recorded recorded a four piece. Their second their second album issued in October of 1990 was mischievously titled "Troubling Troubling Wilburys, Volume Three. According to Lynn, that was George's idea. He said, "Let's confuse the buggers." As we said, let's let's confuse the buggers. Let's confuse the buggers. That's a, like that's an English term. That's a term in England. Let's confuse the buggers. It peak it peaked at number 14 in the UK and 11 in the US, where it was certified platinum. The Wilburys never performed live 
on stage and the group and the group did not record together again until the following release of their second album in december of 91 harrison joined clapton for a tour in japan in japan in japan that's what he did he joined he joined clapton in the tour for a tour that was uh okay so what it says here harrison joined clapton for a tour of japan it was harrison's first since 1974 no others followed nobody followed nobody and mama followed on the 6th of april 92 this is before this before the shit went down with a uh, this before tupac shakur this 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 before tupac Moprim, and mouse went to the uh to the glam slam to perform to perform the songs It used to be princess it used to be princess club and on top of that shit on top of that shit the ronald howard the ronald howard uh incident happened when ronald ray howard killed uh, a dps state trooper in uh in uh in texas and he was on the run from the cops in texas and they, and they 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 chase him down. They start chasing him down. They start chasing him down. They pulled him over. They arrested him for the murder of William Davidson, who was a uh, who was a state trooper for the Department of Public Safety. And then this shit, the the riots happened in Los Angeles, California. People went going, people going crazy in LA, start throwing shit around. They start throwing shit around. They start throwing shit around. They bust, they busting up, they busting up in the stores and start taking shit. Yeah, and all of a sudden they start and uh, they they start busting in the stores in LA, and start taking shit. They started burning shit down. They went crazy. They started beating up. They started Henry Watson football and others. They went to the streets. They they started beating up a uh, a uh, a guy named Reginald, a guy named Reginald, named the guy named Reginald Denny, who was uh, a truck driver. They beat him up. They 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 fuck they fucked him up. They fucking him up. They hit him with a goddamn brick. They fucking him up. They hit him with a goddamn brick or some sort of fire hydrant or some object football had in his hand he beat him up and they almost killed him then he just left it they just left him he left him there laying so this white this white cracker son of a bitch wanted to get his ass in this goddamn fucking truck and go drive his own ass to a goddamn hospital where he's gonna get where he gonna get his head examined that's what happened when you don't get into the riots back in the days. It's been 31 years. And then later, Denny went to Donahue or some other talk show. All of a sudden he confronted Henry he confronted Henry Watson on the air on that show. That show has already been off the air for years. So I don't explain none of that from, from the general public until then. So it was over. And then until all the shit happened with uh until after after 1991 when Murray Hodgson was fired because he doesn't because he refused to sleep with Pat Patterson. The gay sex scandal. 
in the WWE started happening. Involving, involving Barry Orton and Tom Cole. The two people that are no longer, they're no longer with us. But that's already out of the picture. So I'll go on in there. I'm about to go on and uh, be done with this, with that little stuff that's the, the, the segment that happened. But until, until these reasons why Ronald Howard got pulled over by, by the cops because they found they found the two pocalypse now, the two pocalypse now tape. They found the tape in the car. Actual tape in the car that'd be Tupac's first Tupac's first album. Tupac Clips Now. That album was released since 1991. It had 13, it had 13 songs in it. So Howard had had uh had, had his attorney backing them up. It's probably it's probably because of Howard Howard killing Davidson. It's probably because of the song called our soldier story. There's it's like it's like they pulled me over and I laughed. I blasted Rodney King and up and then I blast on this punk gas. That's what it says. That came from from Soldier Story. It came from the song Soldier Story, that was on Tupac Clips Now. So that's what incited that man to go kill a cop. So until the two thousands. He uh Howard uh was executed to death. Even though it was lethal injection and whatnot for some reason. But uh it's over. On back to the Harrison Harrison thing. It's not about me, it's about George Harrison. Uh George Harrison, he held a benefit concert at the natural law party at the Royal Albert Hall in his first London performance since the Beatles 1969 rooftop concert. In October of 1992, he performed at a Bob Dylan tribute concert at Madison Square Garden in New York City. In New York, in New York City, playing alongside Dylan, Clapton, McQuinn, Petty and Neil Young, the Beatles anthology album. In 1994, Harrison began co a collaboration with McCartney star and producer Jeff Whelan, and producer Jeff Whelan, for the Beatles anthology project. This included the, the recording of the two new Beatles songs, built in round solo, and around the solo vocal and piano tapes recorded by Lennon himself was later deceased as well as lengthy, lengthy interviews yes yeah, as, well as, as well as lengthy interviews about the Beatles career it was released it was released in December of 1995 free, free as a bird was the first new Beatles song uh was it let me let me rephrase oh yeah free, free as a bird was the the first new Beatles single since 1970. In March of 96, this is this is this will happen. This happened before before my father was uh was murdered. This was this, this was before before my father was killed. Before that, it was Tupac Shakur, Suge Knight. It was Tupac, Suge Knight. Uh, where, where, where had to had to fly. They had to fly to the Vegas again. To go to go see that Tyson Bruno uh heavyweight boxing match. And all of a sudden they went home. They went back to LA. And and then and then and then and then and then 
And then a couple of days later, my my father was my father was gunned down and killed, execution style. <sighs> Let me go find it out because it's not. I should never I should never brought this up again. I know it's coming back to haunt my ass. I know it's coming back to fucking haunt my ass in the long run. I'm sorry I had to bring this shit up, uh, YouTube. In March of 1996, they released a second single, Real Love. That looks like a reminder of a song that Mary J. Blige had, had, had wrote and sung. You know, but it was out first, I think. What is he? It was a 1960s, uh, it was a 1970s, uh, record. Harrison refused to participate in the comp on the completion. George Harrison, man, what his refusal? He refused to participate in the completion of a third song. Poor thing, he, why he did not want to participate in the completion of song song number of song number three. He later commented on the project says, I hope, hope somebody does this to all my crap demos. When I'm dead, make them into hit songs. Oh, he said this. George George said this shit, man. It's, he said his his response is, I hope somebody does this to all my crap demos. I'm going to this. I hope somebody does this to all my shit demos when I'm dead. Make them into hit songs. God damn. He felt, I don't know what he felt this way about. He hoping, he hoping that somebody does this to all his shit demos and when he's dead, and he's and then they're gonna make them into hit, into them hit songs. That is bad. He found I know he felt that way. I hope somebody does this to all my crap demos when I'm dead. Make them into hit songs. And that's what he said. That's what he said happens to him. And it's coming to haunt him. Light to life and death, nineteen ninety seven. All the way to 2001, after the anthology project, Harrison collaborated with Ravi Shankar on the latter's Chance of India. Harrison's last TV appearance was a BH1, BH1 special to promote the album taped in May of 97. This is right after my 15th birthday. Uh, back then. Soon afterwards, Harrison was, Harrison was diagnosed with throat cancer. Harrison had the same thing Brian uh, Pillman did. He had the same thing Brian Pillman had when Brian Pillman was a kid. Back in those days, the 60s. He was treated with radio radiotherapy, which was thought at the time to be successful. He publicly blamed years of, of smoking for the illness. In January of 1998, Harrison attended Cole Perkins' funeral. Yeah, that's what George Harrison did when he, when he got sick. He attended Cole Perkins' funeral in Jackson, Tennessee, where he performed a brief rendition of one of, one of Perkins' songs, Your True Love. In May, he represented the Beatles at London's High Court in their successful bid to gain control of unauthorized recordings made of a 1962 of a 1962 performance performance by the band at the Star Club in Hamburg in Hamburg the following the following year he was the most active of the former Beatles in promoting the reissue of their 1968 animated film Yellow Submarine this animates it's an animation right here Yellow Submarine On December 30th, 1999, this is this is after the shit that happened with uh 
with the with uh with uh with uh with Sean Combs and Jennifer Lopez and Jamal Barrow. That incident happened at the uh, at a nightclub. That's the incident that happened at the uh in the nightclub. There was a shooting at the nightclub. On December on December thirtieth, nineteen ninety nine, George Harrison and his wife Olivia were attacked were attacked at their home, Fire Park. Michael Abram, Michael Abram, a thirty a thirty four year old thirty four year old man who was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. Yeah, a thirty four year old. Yeah, he's this man named Michael Abram. Michael Abram in that. Why he get that? They get attacked by this dude. They got attacked by a dude who was suffering from paranoid schizophrenia. That guy, Michael Abel, was a paranoid schizophrenic. That guy broke into the Harrison home and attacked and attacked George Harrison himself with a kitchen knife, puncturing a lung and causing head injuries. Before his wife incapacitated the assailant by striking him repeatedly with with a fire or a fireplace or fireplace poker and a lamp, Harrison later Harrison later commented. He said, "I felt exhausted and could feel the strength draining from me. I vividly remember a deliberate thrust to my chest." I could hear my lung exhaling and had blood in my mouth. I believed I had been fatally stabbed following the attack. Harrison was hospitalized. Yeah, he was hospitalized with, with more than 40 stab wounds. More than 40 stab wounds. And part of his punctured lung was removed. He released a statement soon afterwards regarding regarding his regarding his assailant he wasn't a burglar and he certainly wasn't auditioning for the traveling warberries adi shankawa adi shankawa an indian historical spiritual and grew and groovy type person once said like life is fragile like a like a raindrop on a lotus leaf on a lotus leaf that's a word, lotus leaf. And you better believe it, upon being released from a mental hospital in 2002, after less than three years in the state custody, Abram said, if I could turn back the clock, I would give anything not to have done. What I did in attacking George Harrison, looking but looking back on it now, I have come to under have come to understand that I was at the time not in control of my actions. My actions. I can hope. I can only hope the Harrison family might some might somehow find it in their hearts to accept my apologies. I don't. I don't think. I don't think George and Olivia would buy into that shit. The injuries inflicted on Harrison during the during the home invasion were downplayed by his family and their comments to the press having seen Harrison looking so healthy beforehand beforehand those in his social circle those in his social circle believed that the attack brought about a change in him and was the uh, cause for his cancer's return that's because his his cancer started coming back in May 2001, May of 2001, it was revealed that Harrison had Harrison had undergone an operation to remove a to remove a cancerous growth from one of his lungs, from one of his lungs. And in July, it was it was reported reported that he was being treated for a brain tumor at a clinic in Switzerland. While in Switzerland, Star visited him. Yes, where goes where goes Star? Remember the Beatles. Is visiting him is visiting him but he had to cut it short to stay his to, to, to stay his travel what is he saying a star visited him but he had to cut short 
his uh his his stay to travel to Boston or oh, it's in Massachusetts where his daughter was was undergoing an emergency brain surgery Harrison who was very weak quipped do you want me to come with you in late 2000 in late 2001 he began radiotherapy at the Staten Island University Hospital in New York City in NYC non-small cell lung cancer that he had spread to his brain he had spread to his brain when the news made public oh yeah Harrison bemoaned his physician's breach of privacy and his estate later claimed damages on November on November 29th 2001 Harrison died at a property belonging to Beatles member Paul McCartney on Heather Road in Beverly Hills, Los Angeles, California. In Beverly Hills, Los Angeles. He was 58 years old. He was 58 years old. He died in the company of Olivia Dani Shankar and the latter's wife, Sukanya and daughter Anushka. Yeah, Anushka and Hare Krishna devotees Shayam Masundar Das Emukanda Gaswami Emukanda Gaswami who chanted verses for the for the uh Bihagavad Jita his final message to the world as relayed in a statement by Olivia and Dani by Olivia and Dani was everything else can wait but but the search of god cannot wait the and love one another he was cremated at hollywood forever cemetery and his funeral was held at the self realization fellowship lake shrine in pacific palisades palisade it was word in pacific palisades california his close family scattered his ashes, according to Hindu tradition, in a private ceremony in the Ganges and Yamuna rivers near Varanasi, India. He left almost 100 uh, million quid in his will. Harrison's final studio album, Brainwashed, that was, that was about to be released got put on hold in 2001 until it got released until it got released in 2002. posthumously after it was completed by his son Donnie and and Jeff Lynn a quotation from the Bahabha, from the Bahagavad Jita is included in the album's liner notes There was never a time when when you you or I did not exist, nor will be any future when we shall cease to be a media only single stuck in it's called stuck inside a cloud, which Lang described as a uniquely candid reaction to illness and mortality. Achieved number twenty seven on the Billboard's adult contemporary chart. The single Any Road, released in May 2003, peaked at number 37 on the singles chart, UK singles chart. Marwa Blues, that's what name, Marwa Blues, went on, went on to receive the 2004 Grammy Awards for the Best Pop Instrumental Performance, while Any Road was nominated for Best Male Pop Vocal uh, Performance. Let me get to the top of the part two of it anyway. I'll do part two of it anyway. I gotta go to the top first. Go to the top first before I had to. Let me go to the top. 
God, let me go to the top. Let me go to the top before I had to, you know. George Harrison, George Harrison MB was an English musician and singer songwriter who achieved international fame, international fame as the lead guitarist of the Beatles. Sometimes the quiet Beatle Harrison embraced Indian culture and helped broaden the scope of popular music through his incorporation of Indian instrumentation and Hindu aligned spirituality in the Beatles work out though. The majority of the band's songs were written by John Lennon and Sir, John, uh, Sir James Paul McCartney. Most Beatles albums from 1965 onwards contained at least at least two Harrison compositions. Two Harrison compositions. His songs uh, for the group for the group is including "Taxman," "Within You, Without You," "While My Guitar Gently Weeps," "Here Comes the Sun," and something. Harrison's earliest musical influences included George Formby, Django, and Django Reinhardt. Subsequent influences were, were Carl Perkins, Chet Atkins, and Chuck Berry. By 1965, he had begun to lead the Beatles into folk rock. That can become a music, a hybrid music genre. Through his, through his interest in Bob Dylan and the Birds and towards Indian classical music, through his use of Indian instruments such as sitar, such as sitar, what in which he had become acquainted with on the set of the movie Help. He played the sitar on numerous Beatles songs, starting with the Norwegian wood, bird has, this bird has flown. Having initiated the band's embracing transcend transcendental med meditation in 1967 in 1967 he subsequently he subsequently developed an association with the Hare Krishna the Hare Krishna movement after the band's breakup in 1970 Harrison released the triple album all things must pass a critically a critically a critically acclaimed work that produced his most successful hit single my sweet Lord introduced his signature sound as a soul artist the slide guitar. He also organized a 1971 concert for Bangladesh with Indian musician Ravi Shankar, a precursor to later benefit concerts such as Live Aid. In his role as a music and film producer, film producer Harrison produced the acts signed to the Beatles Apple record label, the Apple record label founding Dark Horse Records in 1974. He co-founded Handmade Films in 1978 initially to produce the Monty Python's troop comedy film called The Life of Brian. Harrison released several best-selling singles and, and uh, the albums. That's what Harrison did. He released those several things. He released several best-selling singles and albums as a solo performer in 1988. As a solo performer. In 1988, he co-founded the Platinum Selling Supergroup. Yeah, the Supergroup is already Platinum Selling. It's called the Traveling Wolberries. The Traveling Wolberries that was that was made up of of Dylan Harrison. It's made of Dylan Harrison, Lynn, Orbison, and Petty. A prolific, a prolific recording artist. He was featured as a guest guitarist on tracks Badfinger, Ronnie Wood, and Billy Preston, and collaborated on songs and music with Dylan. With Dylan. Clapton, Starr, and Petty, among others, Rolling Stone magazine have ranked him the number eleven in their first on uh, their list of their one hundred greatest guitarists of all time. He is a two-time Rock and Roll Hall of Famer inductee. He was an inductee of the uh, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yep, he's like the Hall of Fame Rock and Roller. The Rock and it was like on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductee, and he was one of them. He, had, he was inducted two times. He was a member of the Beatles, member of the Beatles in 1988, and posthumously for his solo career in 2004. Harrison's first marriage to Patty Boyd, who was a model, in 1966, 
and it ended in divorce in 1977. The following year that he married Olivia Arias, with, with whom he had a son with, with whom he had a son, Donnie, Harrison died from lung cancer in 2001 at the age of 58, two years after surviving a knife attack by an intruder at his house, his home, Friar Park. His remains were cremated and the ashes were scattered, according to the Hindu tradition. A private ceremony in the Ganges in Yamuna Rivers in India. He left the, he left he left an estate of almost 100 million quid. I'm about to go do part two of this. Uh, I'm about to go do part two of this thing. Come on. I'm in the stream and go do part two of it. Go do that next video. I'm about to go do part two of it, man. See you on the next video.